Our next speaker is Evelyn Carrot, an independent scholar who is formerly the scholar in residence and associate professor of art history at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. She's an expert particularly on early Italian drawings and early Italian drawing collectors and the author of two important books on the subject. In 2002, she wrote a book about the drawings of Stefano da Verona and his circle. And then in 2014, her book on the Antonio Secondo Badile album and the origins of collecting drawings in early modern northern Italy. When we began formulating the lineup for our symposium, we thought it very important to have someone talk about collecting before Vizzari, before the first great collection that most of us know about. And with that in mind, Evelyn was the obvious choice. So please welcome her to the stage. She comes to discuss collectors in the years before Vizzari. Thank you, John, for your very nice invitation to speak today. I'm very pleased to be here, and I look forward to two very stimulating days. Good afternoon. And please tell me if you can't hear me. The tradition of collecting drawings in the early modern era in northern Italy before Vasari is a subject that deserves detailed consideration. My paper will discuss a number of early individuals who shaped the direction of collecting drawings and focus on case studies of non-noble, humanist, artist, and aristocratic connoisseur collectors, their rich, diverse collections, and their motivations and patterns of collecting. I'll explore the role of the region as a center of drawing collection. The urge to collect was a distinctly Renaissance phenomenon that attests to the period's inquisitiveness, the aspiration toward comprehensive knowledge, and cultivated tastes. Collecting of drawings commenced in the 14th century in northern Italy. Drawing was an integral part of the northern Italian culture, and paper was becoming more available. The social status of artists slowly increased, and many began to think of themselves not just as craftsmen, but as educated, creative individuals of intellectual achievement. Artists gained social stature, stature, with some invited to participate in court life. As Francis Ames Lewis has noted, outside of the workshop, the growing consciousness of the artistic worth of drawings was stronger in northern than in central Italy. Drawings came to be considered the foundation for, works in all, for work in all the arts, and we see an increased production. Extensive building campaigns in the second half of the 15th century required drawing activity. Architectural drawings documented northern Italian antiquities, and preparatory drawings were made for woodcuts. Northern Italian artists made finished drawings that were accepted as works of art in their own right. Superbly finished images, like Montaigne's signed and dated drawing of Judith and the Uffizi, were seen as precious objects comparable with paintings. The new North Italian appreciation of graphic arts, aided by the availability and the dissemination of prints, awakened an eagerness to collect and to conserve drawings. In addition, collecting drawings emerged as an extension of the humanist intellectual aesthetic movement and the, and the fascination with the physical remains of ancient cultures and ancient civilizations. As early as the 14th century, a new enthusiasm for classical antiquity and the rejuvenation of classical studies emerged in humanist centers in Verona, Padua, Treviso, and Venice. The poet Petrarch and other northern Italian pre-humanists assembled great collections of classical texts, antique coins, medals, and ancient sculpture. 
An exceptional case is recorded in a famous memorandum by a privileged Cicciadino in Treviso in 1335, the pioneering notary and money lender Oliviero Forzesa, who amassed rare manuscripts by Ovid, Cicero, and Horace, and collected codices, sculptured heads, marble reliefs, bronze figures, and engraved gems. Many others, like the, like the Venetian cardinal Pietro Barbo, had their own collections of antique artifacts in the first half of the 15th century. And the antiquarian and merchant trader Siriaco d'Ancona returned from numerous trips through Greece, the Middle, the Middle East, and Asia Minor with precious objects, including statues, vases, and Roman porphyry. Syriaco transcribed inscriptions from ancient monuments, sometimes embellished with drawings, which he gathered into collections called syllogies. Disseminated in books, on paper and parchment, they served as reference tools and afforded mental stimulation. Ardent epigraphic followers of Syriaco, like the humanist antiquarian poet and quintessential Renaissance man, Felice Felice da Verona built extensive collections of syllogies. That is Syriaco. Built extensive, extensive collections of syllogies embellished with drawings. The trend of Constructing collections continued into the 16th century when collectors possessed new valuables as natural curiosities, modern sculpture, contemporary paintings, and Netherlandish works. Marc Antonio Micchio, in his notebook, The Notizia Dopita del Disegno, describing artworks between 1521 and, 14, and 1543, recur, recorded diverse items collected by 11 patrician and non-noble uh, private collectors, including the eminent Paduan humanist and jurist Marco Mantova Benavides and the illustrious Venetian patrician Gabriel Levandramin. Thus, the North Italian humanists, antiquarians, and those that followed established private collections. As a class of exclusive valuable objects, the collections symbolized knowledge, prestige, and cultivation for their collectors. The first collectors systematically assembled and organized their own favorite categories of objects and created priorities of excellence and worth. In their critical choices, these collectors became the first connoisseurs. Even before humanist collectors, the earliest known documented collector with the financial means to pr produce drawings or purchase drawings was Oliviero Forzeta, the antiquarian collector mentioned above. In his famous account book of 1335, he reminded himself to purchase drawings on his next shopping trip to Venice. He wanted to acquire notebooks, sketchbooks, and graphic arts by recently deceased Venetian artists Peranzolo and Gioacchino Tadaldo, including diverse animals and naked men based on pagan content. Fort Seta's memorandum also mentions specific cartoons and drawings on paper by Paolo and Marco da Venezia. So Forsetta begins the trend of private collecting of drawings, and in his will of 1368, he stipulates that on his death, the drawings, paintings, and sculptures be sold at auction with the earnings used to set up a dowry, end a dowry endowment for girls in need. By doing a good deed, this usurer felt that he could absolve himself in the afterlife. Unlike later collectors that I shall discuss, he made no provisions for his collection to remain intact after his death. His collection was dispersed and lost, and there is no inventory. 
humanists, through ingenuity and expertise, introduced innovations into their collecting practices and discovered new collectibles like drawings with which to distinguish themselves. They appreciated drawings for their cultural value, for the artist's prestige, for the aesthetic qualities, and also for the historical significance. Often humanist collectors desire that their collections should be intact after their deaths. These collectors also circulated and exchanged objects, the social activity of gift giving becoming as important as the owning of the object itself. The crucial figure in collecting of drawings was Felice Feliciano, whose syllogies uh, collections we have been viewing. Feliciano, born in 1433, is the earliest known private collector of identifiable drawings in the Renaissance, and he was among the first to value drawings as works of art worthy of preservation. He applied his, his experience, his talents, and his instincts as a collector of syllogies to his collection of drawings. Less wealthy than his elevated circle, he introduced novelty into his collecting. The drawings resulted from the exchanges of gifts from artists and humanist friends, reciprocations for his verses and his poems, or payments in kind. The collection was an indication of his curiosity, his cultivation of scholarly learning, his appreciation for beauty, and his position in a humanist intellectual milieu. <clears throat> Until recently, it was accepted that drawings were first collected in the 16th century. The Florentine artist and writer Giorgio Vasari was recognized as the first collector of drawings. The evidence, however, supports a different story. In my recent book, The Antonio Bedile Album of Drawings and the Origins of Collecting Drawings in Early Modern Northern Italy, I emphasize the pivotal role that Feliciano played. His status of, as a collector of drawings was first recognized through the discovery of his 1466 will in which he enumerates his estate the principal parts uh, being comprised of drawings, ancient metals, and classical manuscripts. The will informs us that his drawings on paper were by several excellent masters with whom he was acquainted. That he bequeathed these drawings, valued at 80 ducats to his brother-in-law, indicates the high value in which he held them. No inventory of his collection exists. The contents of his landmark collection were unknown Oops. until I identified the oldest known collector's insignia on 13 early 15th century drawings by Felice, uh, drawings in Felice's collection, thus push, pushing back the date of collecting drawings almost a century. He was the first collector to inscribe his drawings with a personal cryptic inscription and distinctive monogram. And you can see that Feliciano has included his signature and his mark. Right here. Above the arcade and the drawing on the right, the martyrdom of fire. It's partially erased, but still distinguishable with ultraviolet rays, and it reads, Questo disegno fo de felixo, to the right of a cross, bisecting a circle, in either half of which is placed an F and E. The form of disegno and felixo are in antique Veneto vernacular, and that places the collector in Verona. The monogram, which precedes the inscription, incorporates the letters of Felixo's name with the sign of the cross. Veronese archival documents confirm the identification of, Fili Fel with, of Felixo with Felice Feliciano. That Felicio originated the innovation of inscribing his drawings with a collector's mark 
gave rise to the concept of provenance for drawings. And as a scribe, he recognized the importance of, and proof of ownership. Among the 13 drawings are several attributable to Stefano di Giovanni da Verona, an important international Gothic artist. And they originally formed a putative sketchbook, now dismembered. 30 years later, the sketchbook became a collector's item for Feliciano, the first known instance of a sketchbook with existing images achieving the status of a collectible item in northern Italy. And Feliciano inscribed the drawings. St. Anthony Abbott and the Madonna of Humility and the three standing figures in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And here you can see that he signed his name with his monogram. Feliciano puts his signature on the verso of the image on the left. Other drawings from the sketchbook now exist in the Uffizi and also at Dresden. The sketchbook may have held eight or other known drawings, and it probably included many more. Feliciano also owned drawings by other artists that were not in the sketchbook. From the workshop of Stefano comes an allegorical figure on the left, and an angel in flight with Feliciano's signum in the Robert Lehman and in the Albertina collections. Feliciano's documented and partially lost collection instructs us about the earliest enthusiasm for the art of collecting drawings. Another category of collectors in northern Italy were professional artists who gathered drawings in their workshop for instructional purposes or to be passed along to offspring to keep the, to, for the continuity of the workshop tradition. The prime example is the famous Paduan master, uh, Francesco Squarcione. However, Antonio Badile II, born in 1424, went much farther, and he can truly be called the first true artist collector. At the beginning of the 16th century, Badile headed a well-established Veronese family bottega that was at the height of its commercial activity. Although he was a working artist, he assembled and conserved drawings that he valued instead for connoisseurship practices. His motivation reflected a growing appreciation of visual culture and a search for fulfillment in private life through contemplation and also recreation. The importance of the collection was, re was recognized by his sons, who in the 1530s assembled his drawings and created a memorial or a tribute to him in the form of an album. They pasted the drawings onto the original blank blue pages, which are seen on the screen uh, at the Washington National Gallery on the left and the Rijksmuseum on the right. However, the sons, Bartolomeo and Francesco, their creative imagination was needed to conceive of a set of drawings as a collection uh, housed in a collector's album. Mid 15th century epigraphic syllogies combining words and images like those produced by Siriaco and also Feliciano might have offered a prototype for the Antonio Badile album, especially due to the innovative use of attribution labels. The Badile album is the earliest Western surviving album known in Northern Italy, produced in Verona. It anticipates Vasari's work as a collector by several decades. The album, which contained almost 100 drawings, no longer exists in its original form. This is the cover, which reads in translation, drawings by various people collected by Antonio Badile II, painter in the year 1500. The missing words were written on the, the original flap, which folded over to secure the album, and that would be this area here. Uh, by its uh, 
but regrettably, the album was dismantled in the 1950s by its last owner, the London dealer Francis Matisson, and its contents were dispersed. In my recent book on the album, my colleague Peter Windows and I reconstructed the album from the surviving photographic replica that Matisson made. Of the original 99 sheets on 32 pages, we have identified 64 known sheets that survive in collections worldwide. The album contradicts the old notion that early collectors were parochial in their approach. It includes Im images from 15th century Verona, including examples by artists in the Circle of Montaigne, and displays drawings by artists from farther afield, such as France and Siena. The collection is unusual for its time, given its broad scope, containing narrative, religious, secular, antique, allegorical, and also genre themes. Although many are not master drawings, they are examples of everyday working practice. The Morgan Library and Museum is fortunate to have two album drawings, Man Carrying a Bundle of Wood and Vegetables by Marco Zoppo, that the collector Janis Schultz donated to the collection, and Sea God and other figures after the Battle of the Sea God uh, by uh, Montaigne. Of high artistic quality, Portrait Head of a Boy in Profile is at the National Gallery in Washington, and a bust of a young man in profile is at the Art Institute in Chicago. As a collection, the album is an unparalleled artifact in the history of Italian Renaissance drawings. Remarkably, it survived intact four and a half centuries, and it illuminates the world of the early modern artist. Originally conceived as a miscellany, the album in its final form is a celebration of the singular achievement of Antonio Badile II. That the album was assembled in the workshop setting is not unexpected, but the Badile album, constructed of blue paper, anticipates, interestingly, the books of drawings on colored paper assembled later in Verona by artists like Paolo Farinati and perhaps even Paolo Veronese, a, pu a pupil of, of Antonio Badile III, and also many of Asari's Libro drawings, which are on colored prepared sheets. By the 16th century, private collectors in the Veneto were carefully constructed for increasingly elite patrons, usually patricians. The addition of drawings to their antiquarian collections enhanced the collection's value. Collectors conserved their collections for future generations, yet their motives appear to have extended to showing off the virtue of, ev of every owner or each owner to enlarge his self-image, his status, and his fame. Collections were a form of public display that friends were invited to view. Often collections were set in a studio low to show off the contents. The collector constantly sought to improve the quality and the diversification of his collection, acquiring new drawings and deaccessioning others. Although many drawings have failed to survive, they were documented in wills, inventories, and memoranda. Two important collections mentioned above exemplify these trends, that of the Paduan Marco Mantova Benavides and the Venetian G Gabriele Vondramin, the man in red in Titian's great votive painting. Two documents provide the foundation for studying the, the drawing collection of Benavides. The Notizia of Michiel, who visited Benavides' home in 1537, and the 1695 inventory of Marco's heir, Andrea. Benavides was an avid collector who exhibited his drawings in the first room of his home, along with his paintings, prints, and antiquities. The layout of his imposing gallery was inspired by the Roman era. The drawings, many by Domenico Campagnola, along with watercolors and prints, 
were handsomely framed in walnut, pear, and ebony. Benavides arranged his house to welcome collector friends who would appreciate the prized possessions, and they reflected his worthiness. Benavides took great pride in the space and its collection since he sent a model of the study to the collector Andrea Loredan in 1553. Benavides' drawings and paintings numbered 98, although there were more drawings and sketches in pen, chiaroscuro, and watercolor than panel paintings, but all are lost. Although historians have focused primarily on his paintings and his antiquities, Von Dramin, born in 1484, owned one of the first extensive documented and inventoried private collections of drawings in the early 16th century, praised by the writer Anton Francesco Doni in 1552 and the publisher Francesco Sansovino in 1556, the collection probably peaked at 1,000 drawings. Three surviving documents provide insight into Vondramin's collecting habits. The Notizia of Michiel, who, who visited Vondramin's Palazzo in 1530, Vondramin's Will of 1548, in the Archivio di Stato in Venice, and an inventory in Vondermin's, uh, of Vondermin's collection compiled between 1567 and 69 in the Biblioteca Casa Goldoni in Venice. Vondermin's drawing collection, displayed in his Camerino delle Antigalle, was larger than any other collection of drawings seen by Michiel. Among surviving objects, is Jacopo Bellini's famous drawing book on bombazine paper in the British Museum. Two pen and ink drawings, uh, both attributed to Raphael by Michiel, and recorded later in the inventory or in the Louvre. The appearance of Saints Peter and Paul to Attila and the Huns before Pope Leo is thought to be a modello for the fresco in the Stanza di Eliodoro in the Vatican. A nativity or an adoration of the shepherds discussed by Rosella Lauber was later owned by Everard Jabach, Pierre Crozat, and Pierre Jean Mariette before entering the Louvre. Both are thought to be by Raphael or probably most likely by John Francesco Penny. Vondermin's later will of 1548 does not itemize individual works. He confides that the collection afforded him a little peace and quiet to his soul, away from the demands of his business, a place of respite, relaxation, and contemplation. He prohibits the sale of objects from his collection, stating that, that it must be preserved intact and passed on to a deserving, virtuous descendant. Fifteen years after Vondermin's death, a detailed inventory ordered by Vondermin's family was finally completed and the entire collection was sealed until 1615, when it was dispersed by Vondramin's great-great-grandnephew around 1657. The comprehensive inventory indicates that considerable acquisitions were made after Vondramin viewed the collection, and also many deaccessions. De the drawings were stored and displayed in the Camerino uh, that was designed with niches, cabinets, cupboards, draw drawers, wardrobes, uh, like that of Benavides. Most drawings were kept in 14 special albums that contained more than 550 drawings. And after albums, the inventory lists 10 drawing books and also model books. Hundreds of lesser drawings and loose sheets were stored in albums, boxes, portfolios, bundles, and in four important roles. The inventory specifies the size of the volumes and the parchment and bombazine paper used. The elaborate color covers in highly uh, brightly colored leather and parchment indicate that the albums were custom made of very expensive material. Although the inventory's description of the artist is vague, the compilers mention specifically drawings by important artists. Uh, 
like Jacopo and Giovanni Bellini, uh, Mantegna, Domenico Campagnolo, Raphael and Parmigianino. Two profile drawings in the Musée Condé in Chantilly inscribed uh, 1505, according to Jennifer Fletcher, have been associated with descriptions in the inventory. The first is a profile of Vittore Bigliano by Giovanni Bellini, and the second, a portrait of Bellini drawn by his pupil, Belliano. An unidentified drawing listed in the, the inventory as a Venus by Raphael with five small putae and, and a Vulcan is now associated by Peter Windows with a drawing in the Louvre attributed to Raphael. It's known from a 1530 engraving by Agostino Veneziano in the center of the screen bearing an inscription of Raphael and is in reverse of a painting by Giulio Romano's workshop in the Louvre uh, the image on the right-hand screen. Unlike Feliciano, Vondramin did not use a collector's mark, yet his, the splendor of Vondramin's collection reflected his discrimination, his style, and gentilezza. The only other comparable drawing collection is that of the Parmese Francesco Bayardo, discussed by Popham, that was passed down from Parmigianino's workshop and recorded in a 1561 inventory of hundreds of drawings. The compiler enumerates the extent of Bayardo's collection in detail, which elevated the owner's intellectual status. The inventory concerns subject matter, dimensions, techniques, and degrees of finish, and lists such objects or subjects as al antica, erotic, genre, presentation, or finished drawings, preparatory, religious, and also portraits. The collection of drawings discussed above augment our knowledge of the collecting of drawings, one of the most quintessential aspects of Renaissance culture and its aesthetics. They testify to the increasing interest in the persona of the artist, his creative process and working method, and the extension of such professional concerns from the studio of the painter to the studiolo of the new connoisseur who valued and creatively displayed this new art form. And they illustrate that Northern Italy was a center of artistic activity and also creativity. Northern Italian artists created copious drawings that were for the early modern period, period worthy of appreciation. And the community of the Veneto cultivated a group of collectors capable of appreciating this creativity, deeming it worthy of value, accumulation, and also display. The early collections of drawings stimulated the awareness, appreciation, and potential of drawings shaping subsequent collecting and promoted the desire to, to preserve drawings for posterity. And finally, these early Veneto collections importantly challenge the Vasarian presumption concerning the preeminence of Florentine disegno and offer a geographic corrective to a Vasari-based pre prejudice. Thank you. <laughs>